Hey there, sports history fan. This is Arnie Chapman, host of the Football History Dude podcast, right here on the Sports History Network. Now, before we jump into another sports history adventure, let me tell you about this episode's sponsor. We partnered with Rochester Sports Autographs, the largest JSA authenticated autograph distributor in the United States, where you can get deals on over 30,000 autograph sports collectibles. They even have film, music, and other entertainment autographs on the site, so there's something for everyone. Perhaps you're looking for a gift for Mother's Day, or maybe Father's Day. Heck, who needs a holiday as an excuse to give a piece of sports history to your loved ones? Or how about yourself? Today seems like a great day to add to your sports cave, right? But how is RSA able to offer such great deals on JSA authentication, you ask? Well, they do this by making deals directly with athletes, so there are no extra markups, and they choose to pass these savings on to the customer. All orders from Rochester Sports Autographs are top quality and shipped to your door with top authentication and money-back guarantee. And to make sure RSA knows that the Sports History Network sent you, we created a special link for you. All you have to do is head to shop rsa.com forward slash shn again that's shop rsa.com forward slash shn head over there to get your piece of sports history today this is our league and this is your league from the 55 yard line on cfl america radio and the sports history network Welcome to another edition of From the 55-Yard Line. It's Gridiron America. Scott is on assignment tonight, so he will not be joining us. He's at, a, he's at the NIT Basketball Finals. and uh, But tonight joining me is a, a name that you know. Football in, When it comes to football history, when it comes to the study of it, there's really one name that stands out, and that's Ken Crippen. He is the founder of the Football Learning Academy and also past president of the Professional Football Researchers Association. And he is joining me from uh, the East Coast there, and it's morning time here in Japan. And uh, Ken, welcome. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. I appreciate sitting down with me, and it's cherry blossom viewing time here in <laughs> Japan. So we're doing this early. So I'll be, uh, after we wrap here, I will be uh, getting ready to go and heading into the big city to go out to the park and enjoy the cherry blossoms like every other a lot of people here in japan do did that yesterday so what's the weather like in your work in your part of the world my friend uh, a little cold today but uh it's supposed to be up in the 70s by the time we get it to uh saturday so oh nice nice well yeah. you know baseball season started so at mm -hmm. least we've got that going for us we know you know the warm weather the warm weather is either here or it's soon to be here so absolutely yeah well hey all that said here um football learning academy um that's uh you know kind of how i got to really know a lot of your work because i know with the pfra heavily involved in that i've always known your name but when you started the football learning academy um i i don't think i i, I signed up immediately and and joined and it's something that just you know i it's amazing the amount of of work you have put into this to get this off the ground. And if you could tell everybody a little bit more how it's how it started and kind of where it's going, because I know it things of uh, your courses, uh, your course offerings have expanded greatly in recent months. Yeah, so I I had been researching and writing about pro football history for thirty years now, maybe more. And I was with the PFRA for an extended period of time, uh, but then I decided I really wanted to go out on my own, uh, and that's when the Football Learning Academy was formed. Essentially, what I'm doing there is it's an online school teaching pro football history. We essentially have two missions while we're there. One is we want to be able to educate the public on the history of the game, similar to what the PFRA is doing. 
And I want people to be able to put the game into historical context. You know, I've said many times before, if you watch ESPN or NFL Network or anything like that, you'd have no idea that pro football started more than 20 years ago. Um, even, you know, if you're lucky, you can go back to Super Bowl one, but they pretty much ignore everything prior to that. So I really want to focus on how the game evolved, how the game formed, a lot of the players and the teams that were associated with building the league into what it is today. And like I said, be able to put the game into historical context. At the same time, I want to be able to help retired players in need. Um, I do a lot of interviews with players. They've been very good to me over the years. Uh, and I want to make sure that you know I can help them out because as I'm interviewing these players, I'm hearing their stories and between CTE and Alzheimer's and dementia and all the surgeries that players are going through, they're getting really beaten up and not everybody's making the multi-million dollar contracts like they are today. So uh, especially the older players are really struggling to be able to pay their medical bills. And so what we do is we take a portion of all the proceeds that we get from our paid classes and we give them to retired players organizations in order to be able to help those players in need. And um, when it comes, you know, talking about the older players and everything, I mean, their or their histories. You've interviewed so many of them. In addition to the written work that's that's out there on football, addition to the archival footage with, you know, say NFL films, there's that oral tradition too. And how um, how often are you able to sit down? I mean, what's 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 it been like for you? scheduling and getting to know these guys how often do you talk to them uh weekly basis sitting down and over the phone and over zoom a chat getting to know their stories and everything depends on the projects that i'm working on for example yeah. when i was writing my book on the buffalo bills of the all america football conference you know it was really hot and heavy getting interviews done uh, trying to get it ready for the book and also because these players were aging, I wanted to make sure that I could interview them while they were still healthy and while they were still alive. So right. there was a big rush at that point to try to get interviews done. Things tapered off a little bit after that. And then it's just a kind of an as needed basis. When I was doing uh, stuff for National Football Post, some Where Are They Now articles, I would do an interview every couple of weeks or so. Now, you know, it's about the same, maybe you know, every few weeks, every month or something like that, I'll try to sit down and really focus on, you know, getting to the heart of a player, not just what they did on the field, but trying to dig in and find out what type of person they really are. Uh, and a lot of the things that they've been doing after they retired, um, you know, their second careers, things like that. So uh, I try to put a lot into those interviews. And so they're not being done as often. Uh, but right. hopefully I'm able to do a deeper dive to, to learn more about them. Right. And, and there's something that I always have always said. And when I've gotten into foot, you know, I've been in really since I've been 10 years old, since, I've, since uh, I first saw a real pro football game on TV, the, the 77 Thanksgiving game between the dolphins and the, and the Cardinals in which Conrad Dobler, if you re, if you remember that game, Chucked his helmet into the stands, and I'm like, "Oh, I'm ten years old. I am hooked on on football." <laughs> um, and uh, even though I was rooting for the Dolphins because I had the same horn rim glasses as Bob Greasy did at that time. Mm -hmm. But the one thing with football that you know, football is football. It's a game, but it's so much. Is is I've gotten older. I've realized just how much it's it's more than just the X's and the O's. It is living history. It's also a reflection of the times, mm -hmm. the things that the, how we watch football now and what's going on in the world of sports, um, is also very much a mirror of what's going on in the outside world. And, um, as you've been, I mean, you're, as, as you've gone along, how much, how much, how much of that is true? I mean, give it good. I could give a whole lot of examples, but you're, you're much more the expert than I am when it comes to talking about history, football, and also what was going on during that time period. What are some good examples of just how much things have changed and with football kind of reflecting that change over the years? Yeah, I mean, I think you're definitely correct in that football mirrors society. 
I mean, you just look at the struggle of African-American players in the National Football League. I mean, there was a time when they were outright banned from the NFL where they couldn't play. Uh, before that, you know, people are always worried about injuries to African-American players because, you know, while they're down on the ground, they get the extra kicks with the cleats and punches and all kinds of stuff. You look at the struggles of African-American quarterbacks coming into the league, how long it took before they were allowed to play that position. I mean, the coaches just wouldn't put them in that position for ridiculous reasons. And so there was a lot of struggles that they were facing as they were trying to get into the league. And even today, you still see, you know, there aren't as many African-American quarterbacks in the league. It's better than it was, but right. there's still a lot more that, that needs to be done. You see that with women in the NFL. How many women have high-level positions within the league? And so, you know, you are seeing similar things in the NFL that you do see in society. I think nowadays society may be moving a little bit faster than the NFL, um, but still you're going to see a lot of mirroring between the two. Right. And the issue with CTE, that's a very, obviously that's something we know a lot now, but Hey, when we were kids, you know, you got your bell rung, you got your bell rung and nobody thought of anything. Um, how much is CTE um, affected not so much the players obviously we we know how much that has affected them and still affecting them but how much has that affected do you think how we view the history of the game now i think when you look at the behavior of some of the players you're thinking well i wonder if that player had cte to cause that type of behavior uh, Jim Tyra is a perfect example of that. Um, yeah, I think that, you know, all the safety rules that they're putting in place nowadays, they were thinking about those types of things earlier on with the equipment that they were wearing, uh, rules that they were putting in place. They didn't have any diagnoses like CTE at the time. Right. But they were working on player safety. They're working on player safety now. Uh, I think there's a lot of things that they're saying they're using it under the guise of player safety when they put some rules in there, but then they do things that don't help players when it comes to safety and it's actually hurting players. So uh, a lot more needs to be done on that area as well, but I think there is definitely some examples that you can point to in history of maybe some of these players had CTE and we just didn't know it at the time. Right. Um, and with, you know, I mean, Mike Webster is obviously the, 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 the poster child for that. How much, w when it comes to him, I mean, what, you know, when I watched the movie Concussion, first of all, uh, I, it, it's an amazing film. I didn't read the book, but I watched the movie. And obviously having played high school football, I remember, you know, getting my bell rung a few times and just kind of what that felt like um but he died at such a very very young age i didn't realize until i saw the movie and I, I was over 50 i mean he was 50 years old when he passed mm -hmm. just how much he uh, just how how phys he, the, again the way he was portrayed in the movie obviously is not the way it was in real life but just knowing that he was only 50 years old when he passed away and the NFL at this point was doing nothing about it was, was, was basically taking the corporate road and um, kind of kicking the can down the kind of kicking the can down the road. Um, mm -hmm. When it comes to CTE right now with the NFL, um, are, are we in a better place now with the league? Um, addressing those issues, especially when it comes to past players and helping them out? Or was that uh, settlement just kind of a one and done with the players? I'm thinking it was probably a one and done. Uh, I'm not seeing as much emphasis on the really older players. Um, it's more of the recent players that they're focusing on. 
I mean, what I do like is that there's a lot of money going into research for CTE. Mm -hmm. And previously, they were only able to diagnose that after a player has passed away and they've examined their brain. Now, it seems like they have some pretty good tests to try to be able to find that prior to their death. You know, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done, a lot of research that needs to be done to see what they can do to treat it once it's discovered. Um, but at least they're going in the right direction as far as being able to discover it prior to their death in hopes that that's going to lead to being able to help them out uh, earlier on and be able to get to it before it becomes a problem. Right. And I know when it comes with CTA, I know the military is heavily involved in in a lot of that research too. I mean, serving in Iraq, that was something, uh, I had friends of mine that got, had traumatic brain injuries during their deployment and um has the and just and if i don't know if, if you know it or not but is the military did the military partner with the nfl there for research on ct at some point i just off the top of my head i think i recall something like that that there was a, a bit of a partnership between the military and and pro football and doing cte research it's possible i don't know um but it wouldn't surprise me if the military was also getting involved in the research because you're going to face similar things, you know, with the the head trauma, uh, especially with people that are deployed. So, yeah. Yeah. So, um, so going back, talking about the football learning Academy, how did this all come about when you decided, Hey, let's do this. Let's, let's make this happen. Um, How did, what was the genesis of the idea? It was basically, I was looking at, Um, some online courses. Uh, I've taken some throughout my career. And I figured that was the next level as far as being able to get football history out to people uh, and try to get it at an affordable cost. A lot of people are doing blog posts nowadays. A lot of people are doing podcasts. And I thought that, you know, by adding that video component as well to try to add more flavor to the uh, classes themselves, uh, I thought was beneficial. So that's how the idea came about. And I started putting those classes together and it seemed to p- seem to work as far as getting that additional information out there. I can talk about specific topics, have slides up on the screens with additional information. Uh, so it's it's really worked out and I've been pretty happy with how things have been turning out. And uh, the course offerings, and I'm looking at the, I'm looking at the, uh, looking at the page here on my page with my all the courses i've signed up for um right now how many courses are available and we're it's the end of march here we're talking for anybody who's listening um how many courses are offered currently where where whereabouts are is the fla at with course offerings i'd say we're right around 30 at this point and it's a mixture of really short classes what we call extra points which are just a few minutes in length We also have full-length courses, which would be an hour or more. We've also got a lot of interviews on there. One of the things that I've been focusing on is trying to dig into my archives of interviews and put out those archival interviews with players. Uh, Some have passed away, uh, so this is an opportunity for current NFL fans to be able to uh, hear firsthand from some of these players and coaches. Um, But I'm also doing recent interviews as well. Uh, I've got one coming up shortly. I've had a few uh, very recently. So we're trying to mix it up, trying to get different eras in there, different backgrounds, uh, and just try to tell the interesting stories in football history. Okay. And in terms of your instructors, I mean, I know, um, you know, Joe Zimba is, is a great, is a good friend of mine. And he is one of, he's one of your main instructors as I'm seeing, as I'm looking uh, at the course offerings. And uh, one of the courses, that I've signed up for, which I haven't started is when the Cardinals left is the, about the Cardinals leaving Chicago. And, um, I've been to, I've lost count how many lectures I've been to with Joe in Chicago. (laughs) Um, tell me, tell for people that don't know Joe, tell people what Joe to me is basically for the sports history network. I like to call him professor emeritus. Um, (laughs) But he's also professor. He is also, I uh, you know, recently the Arizona Cardinals sat down with him for an interview for their uh, for their media to talk about Cardinals history. 
So let's talk about, just talk about Joe as an instructor, what he brings, um, brings a wealth of knowledge. Um, and is he going to be not only talking more of continue uh, with Cardinals history, but does Joe and other, what, uh, it's early morning again. I apologize. I'm still <laughs> the fog. I'm, I'm still a little foggy from, from, from waking up here. Um, who else do you have coming on board along with Joe to teach uh, classes with football learning Academy? Yeah. As you mentioned, Joe is probably the preeminent authority on Chicago Cardinals um, and, you know, Arizona Cardinals and racing Cardinals and, the entire Cardinals franchise. So uh, we're very fortunate to have him at the Football Learning Academy. He's got a couple of classes now. He's working on additional classes for the FLA, and it's mainly going to be focused on Cardinals history. What we try to do with our instructors is to make sure that you know we're bringing in leading authorities on their particular topics. We also have Jeffrey Miller, leading authority on Buffalo football history, and he was talking about the 1920 game between the Buffalo All-Americans and the Canton Bulldogs. Uh, so that's on our uh, on our site. And we have Dave Bonchi, who's a football coach. So he's bringing in the X's and the O's to be able to talk about uh, one class he had, um, formations, how historical formations, you're seeing them in current formations. I mean, single wing is a perfect example of that. He's also talking about you know, putting together a football program. Um, he's got, uh, options talking about option plays, uh, and he's got a full option playbook as part of the class. So there's a lot that he's bringing as well, uh, from the X's and O's side. Uh, we've got Greg Fisheries working on a class. Uh, he just released a book talking about early football history. Uh, it's probably one of the best books I have ever read on early football history. So there's no question he's a leading authority on that topic. And we've got a few other people that are working on things right now, but we try to make sure that everyone that's teaching a class here is a leading authority so that people can trust the information that's being presented to them. Right. Right. It's not like I would, I would say you've got to have, we got, you need to have those guys because you can't have something like, you know, when I was, before I retired from the Navy would sit in on, on PowerPoint presentations by, by somebody who, just read off the powerpoints then mm. you know and seeing and knowing and knowing everybody who who you've just mentioned um you know when i'm s- sitting there it's like yeah i know he knows his stuff uh, uh, i explained to somebody uh about joe and uh, i was telling him hey you need to go out and see joe's lectures out in arizona well who is he uh he he trusts me it's like <laughs> he knows his stuff if he don't know it then it doesn't then then it's then it's a complete unknown it doesn't um, exist. <laughs> yeah, back when the uh, back when the Cubs won the World, it's funny. Back when the Cubs won the World Series, um, I got a call from of all people. I think it was CBS station down in Phoenix, and I had my little Cardinals fan blog up, and they and it had history, and so they reached out to me, and I'm like, oh, he's like, well, we're trying to find an angle on Chicago, uh, on the Cardinals and the Cubs, and. I go, okay, oh, great. But hey, why are you calling? First of all, I'm not the guy you want to talk to. Joe is. And you do realize that the Cubs played at Wrigley Field for a, almost 10 years. No, didn't know that. And then it's so when I, it was, it was that moment where you just like, I can't believe I'm having this conversation. <laughs> Literally, as I'm walking, I'm typing on my, I think it was, yeah, it was my iPhone. But I was typing on the iPhone. I was going to say BlackBerry for a minute um, and walk into a train station. But, you know, after that conversation I had with this reporter, and then eventually I did end, end up going on the news because Joe, Joe kind of punted it to me because he just couldn't make it happen. He's like, oh, you'll do good. You'll, I'm like, okay. Um, but there's so much out there with when it comes to pro football history that people just get utterly wrong nowadays and we're seeing it obviously and you follow my twitter feed and you know you know there's the social media greg and there's also in-person talking but lately when it comes to the spring startup leagues my when people start throwing around numbers and everything and 
that gets my hackles up and everything. I'm like, okay, apparently nobody's reading a history book because what's coming out now in the media is just utterly wrong. So yeah. do you have those? I, I know you've got to have those same frustrations too. I, you know, it's like when, when Joe, every time, every bears Packers game, the graphic goes up about it's the oldest rivalry and I can hear Joe yelling <laughs> down in the South suburbs. Mm-hmm. So is it the same with you when, when you see a lot, are you, are you seeing more and more just we're getting away from history and it's just in the moment, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, you know, one of the reasons why I formed the FLA is because it's, there's a big recency bias going on and everybody's looking at, you know, the last five years, the last 10 years, and that's really all they look at. Yeah. And there's a lot of football history out there and I want people to be able to understand all of that. And like you said, you know, a lot of inaccurate information out there, you see it all the time. Uh, What happens is that somebody will put something out, people just blindly repeat it as if it's the truth without checking it or doing anything to make sure that it's accurate. And they just keep repeating the same thing over and over again. Yeah. And that gets frustrating because you can find the accurate information. It's just people are not doing that. They just are repeating the same mistakes. So I'm trying to correct that as much as I can when I'm teaching these classes, say, hey, I know there's information out there saying this, but really this is what happened. Yeah. And make sure that people understand that, okay, don't listen to the myths that are out there. Make sure you pay attention to the facts. And that's what right. I'm trying to get out. Right. And yeah, it's I always say, you know, when I moved to Japan, I had to give up a lot of my football books. I mean, I had to get I had literally hundreds of football history books. Fortunately, though, a lot of those are available either dig were available digital di, uh, digi, di, digitally, um, either for my Kindle or through say archive.org, which I know, um, you know, is a great source for books that are out of print. If you want to read something and you just want to check it, you can't download it, but you can at least check it out and de- check it out, read it and recheck it out every hour. And I think most of us are, you know, very few, very few of us can read a book in a night. So that's really, it's a nice way to have you with the football learning Academy. So when it comes to that, that written component, um, are you, have you re- ever reached out to say archive.org or, or link to any of their online texts that they have to supplement some of the materials that are available for the courses? I have not. Um, basically I try to incorporate any materials within the classes themselves. Okay. But then I'll also put in references. So if people want to learn more about it, right. uh, they're able to find the original source of where I'm getting the information. So that's the way that we have things set up right now with the FLA. Okay. And when it comes to the NFL, um, their assistance, have you gotten much help, uh, say with NFL from NFL films? Like, uh, you know, I know, uh, you know, you and I both know Chris Willis mm-hmm. and, uh, his, but his, you know, his anybody officially from NFL films, uh, or the, or the NFL itself officially, or in, in some ways blessed off on, on the FLA. Not officially. Um, basically, yeah, I would have to pay a licensing fee, those types of things, if I wanted to get official endorsements right. from them. But, you know, people within NFL circles, I mean, I've got lots of contacts throughout the NFL. Yeah. So I can interview people, whether it's on the record, off the record, um, get information. Uh, I've got lots of contacts over at the Hall of Fame. So if I need right. to get into the archives, then I've got the contacts to be able to do that. Uh, so there's a lot of people that I've built up in my network over the last 30 years that uh, I can I can lean on to try to get some information. But as far as any sort of official endorsements and stuff like that, um, you would have to pay licensing fees to to get that. OK, yeah, I didn't know. I didn't I didn't know. I didn't know that. I didn't know, mm-hmm. know that the uh, the NFL, uh, for lack of a better term, would want tribute uh, for an endorsement. Um mm-hmm. How about north of the border? How about with the CFL, the Canadians? Um, do you, is there any material, any any off course offerings about you know Canadian football coming to the Football Learning Academy? Right now, nothing specific on the CFL. 
Uh, it is something that we want to take a look at, whether it's the CFL. We also want to look at some of the other leagues that competed against the NFL, USFL, WFL, all of those. Uh, so we do want to expand out into all pro football, not just the NFL. Right. Um, we mentioned a little bit you know, when we're going through the first African-American quarterbacks, talking about some that went up to Canada to play uh, because they couldn't get the opportunities in the NFL. So we do cover that. Uh, but as far as classes dedicated to the CFL, uh, there's nothing at this time, but we are looking to add that. Okay. Um, yeah, because I know I, um, it, there's when it comes to the CFL, and again, it goes to where I always get you know frustrated with people mentioning football history, and um, you, you see it. Uh, what was I watching it? Um, oh yeah, somebody on online post mentioned about how NFL, uh, how Warren Moon never won a championship. I'm like, wait a minute, he won like five. You know, five of them i go never won an nfl championship there's a you know it's uh but when it comes to pro football in the states everything is really just centered around the nfl i mean the nfl is you know for lack of a better term they print their own money i mean we're at a point now i mean can you imagine can could you have imagined i mean i can't even when i was a kid where we were back in the 20th century to where we are in the 21st century and being in Japan, I have to explain this to a lot of people because Japanese, I mean, the rest of the world, it's it's soccer or here it's baseball. And to try to explain to any outsider aside from Canada or even Mexico, just what the NFL means to the United States. And I always tell people when I sit down and talk sports with them. Again, going back to what I said about, you know, it's kind of football. It's a reflection of America itself. So is baseball. So is baseball. And that great what, 10 part Ken Burns series mm -hmm. um, exemplifies and, and kind of lays it all out. But that would have just worked that that documentary could work just as well with football, too, because there are so many parallels. Um with history especially with where we're at right now is the nfl do you think forgetting a lot of that history that they did that they had a lot ago because when i turn on the nfl network i i i see nothing except like you said recency bias mm -hmm. yeah uh i mean you look at what the nfl network calls classic games and they go all the way back to last year mm -hmm. um, that's not a classic game in my opinion i mean yeah they'll occasionally toss out like the sea of hands game or the ghost of the post or something like that but it's rare that they're going to do that it's usually within the last five years is what they're calling their classic games see that with espn as well now we did have the 100th anniversary of the nfl recently and so they did focus a little bit on yeah. their history but i think there was a lot more they could have done to celebrate 100 years of the NFL. Uh, but now that the, that celebration is over with, it's pretty much gone back to just, you know, what's happened within the last 10 years or so. Right, right. Yeah, and when they did the 100 players, the 100 greatest, I mean, that was awesome to watch. And it was fun. I mean, I know for you and I, it was fun because like, hey, I was just talking to Upton yesterday. <laughs> he po Upton Bell pops up there. I'm like, oh, you know, or, or you know, it, you know, talking with Chris Willis and that. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I know it's it's yeah it's very frustrating when it comes to the NFL because the NFL films that we grew up with, the Steve Sable, the John Facenda, those days are gone. Right. And when it comes to like for instance baseball, baseball in a way is kind of dying, especially with attendance and everything and ratings. But that's not the case with NFL football. In fact, NFL football seems to be just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So there's the question, you know, and then, but then you have in the CFL where the, it's kind of the same with MLB too. The fans are getting older, the attendance is dropping off, and we're losing a lot of the younger generation. And I think part of that is, I mean, it, I would think, because for me as a kid, it was the history of the game that gravitated, you know, Maybe I'm just weird. Maybe I was a kid that had his nose in an encyclopedia all the time. But how important do you think 
for a league to survive is a history. If you ignore the, is is the adage, if you fail, if um, if you ignore history, you're 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 bound to repeat it. That is so true. And do you see that happening a lot in sports? Not so much with the NFL, but even in other sports right now. Yeah, I mean, I do think it's important um, to understand your history, understand where you came from. Um, don't know if you're necessarily going to end up going backwards, but maybe you will. But yeah. it's being able to truly understand today's game and why you're at where you're at. Why do you have the rules in that you have? What brought that about? Were there specific incidences of, you know, I mean, you talk about violence within the game. Players were dying on the field. So rules were put in place in order to prevent that. And we've continued to see things uh, over time that are part of, you know, cleaning up the game, making the game better. Nowadays, they're focused on how can we get more offense uh, so we hamper the defense, those types of things. So seeing how things evolved, you can see, okay, are these things that they're doing, are they positive or negative changes based off of what we've seen over time? So to me, football history is incredibly important and it's going to be the same in any other sport. Yeah. And also to a big component, a lot of people, we talk about what we don't really talk about, talk about is the importance of media coverage, um, <clears throat> your networks covering it and just how they cover it now. I mean, when we grew up, we had, the NFL today and we had NFL let's say 77 or whatever NBC would call it each year with each corresponding year and we had our pregame shows and that was it but, but now we're at a point now where it is I jokingly said to my wife before the Super Bowl um yeah no pregame started oh about three days ago because <laughs> on the NFL network it's there's so much saturation of coverage but something that I mean, the, there's a lot more, there's better access with the players now with social media and everything. Um, do you think the NFL, do you think social media can hurt the NFL, uh, pro football too? Can you have too much access to players? I mean, not getting, I don't want to get political on any of my podcasts, but I always kind of say I really don't care about people's political opinions when, when it comes to sports. Yeah, I don't care about that either. Um, I want to understand. <laughs> yeah, you know, it, it helps to understand, you know, the person, right? Understands, you know, why they have the philosophies that they have, why they live their lives the way they right. do, things like that. So yeah, it's always important to yeah. be able to learn about a person. But you know, I don't care what side of the aisle they're on; it doesn't matter right. to me. What matters well, to me is how they how they present themselves. Yeah. Um, so you can get on social media, you know, you go out there and say something stupid and you're going to get railed for it. Yeah. And, you know, I think that especially when you get a lot of the younger players just coming in, they're starting to get a lot of attention and they haven't really thought about, okay, everything I say is going to be micro analyzed. Mm hmm. So let me think about what I want to say first instead of just whatever I first think of. Um, so I think yeah. there's going to be a lot more um, public relations training for players, and it's going to start earlier. Uh, it's not just going to be once they get to the NFL. I mean, they're probably going to do that starting in high school when they see players that are looking like they're going to be very successful in college and possibly get to the, prof uh, to the pros. I think that you're going to start seeing a lot more managing of the players and whether that's a good thing or a bad thing i don't know because they're not able to truly be themselves when they're managed like that um but social media can be brutal and you know if you say the wrong thing at the wrong time people interpret it the wrong way whatever the case may be uh, it's going to be a public relations problem for the player which could hurt them when it comes to contract negotiations. Right. And then it's also a bad look on the team. And so now the team is going to have to do something about that. And so it's a double-edged sword. It's good to have access to the players and be able to see them for who they are. But if they're struggling to be able to manage that, then it could end up being a problem for them in the long run. Yeah. You know, I'm just thinking about as we're talking about that, you know, just how, 
you know, I get just generations and, you know, I'm 55. So, I mean, I remember, but I was, I, you know, I just remember, you know, I, I hate sounding like the old guy in the room, but, you know, I was watching, I think it was going through YouTube and I was watching something about Bob Greasy and Bob Greasy is my favorite NFL player. I've, mm. you know, um, but I saw a clip of him when he first signed with the Dolphins. In the maturity level, it just seemed to me of the players back, say, in the 60s and even the 70s, um, was so much better. And I don't, you know, I always wonder if that was just, you know, again, for lack of a better term, we have recency bias, but then you also have people going, oh, the things were so much, people were more mature, people acted better way back when. But just to see, do you ever sit down when you when you look when you look at old film clips, and then knowing all the people that you've met over the years who you've interviewed, and just seeing the the, the players now and getting to see them, how amazed are you at times just to see how how far we've come in say the last sixty years? Yeah, I mean, there's definitely a big difference. I mean, in the early days, professional football was a side gig; they weren't that wasn't their main source of income. So I think that helped with the maturity um, because they're out there in the the working world, earning a living at the same time they're playing professional football. Also, I think, you know, a lot of the players are insulated now. So, you know, their sole focus is football and making sure that they're the best football player they can possibly be in order to have the best career that they can possibly have. And so you're insulated with, you know, a lot of people telling you what you want to hear and wanting to make sure you're happy. And you're not really getting a lot of the life experiences that you need. I mean, criticism, while it's never good to hear it, you know, it helps build character. It helps you become stronger. And if you haven't learned how to deal with that, you end up lashing out, you end up having some other negative consequences coming out of it. So I think with the NFL becoming such a big business that it is, they're focusing more on preparing these players to be able to play professional football. And they're not focusing as much on what's going to make them, you know, a strong human being and the best human being they can possibly be. So I think that's some of the differences that you're seeing in the older players versus some of the more recent players. Okay. And when it comes to, you know, this historical figure because what you just said just kind of triggered a thought here do you think a coach like Lombardi would have been able to be successful in today's age um you know I mean even you know we see how the coaches are now and I got obviously coaching coaching styles are different and how coaching staffs have you know increased exponentially but a historic, put a taking a historical figure like Lombardi, mm-hmm. and to say, you know, even not even not even in this generation, but even maybe a generation back, do you think he would have found the same success as a motivator? With I, yeah, I do. I mean, I think when you take some of these great coaches, great players, they're right. able to adapt to what they need to do to be successful. They're right. not staunch in that this is the only way to do things right i think that they definitely would have adapted so if you bring in lombardi tomorrow to coach a team i think he would be successful because i think he would adapt his methodology to what's going to work the best with the players that he has whether it's the systems whether it's the rules whether it's the players themselves i think he would have adapted and you take some of the great players Uh, from the older days. And I think they would have adapted as well. People say there's no way that they would survive. Well, if you put them through the same training regimens that you have nowadays, I mean, you take an Otto Graham, how great he was back then. Now you put him through the same training regimen that Tom Brady's going through. You're saying he wouldn't be as as successful as Tom Brady. He absolutely would be. So I think that's some of the things that people are losing in the fact that apply the same stuff that you have nowadays to those previous players. And I think you're going to see the same success. Okay. Yeah. Because I mean, you know, mentioning talking about Lombardi, a good example of what, of, of how he would have adapted is Don Shula because Don Shula was his contemporary 
coach during and Don Shula was coaching the Dolphins, I think, up to 95, if I'm not mistaken. In that area, 94, 95. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, he went from having Zonka kick Mercury Morris. You know, the old joke was, you know, Bob Grease, you know, when it comes to that 77 Thanksgiving game, wait, Bob Greasy threw six touchdowns in a game? Are you sure it's not a season? To, you know, then he had Dan Marino and they were just chucking the ball over it. Just, yeah. So uh, I agree with you. It, it, yeah, I think he would have adapted. Um, he would have been fine. Now, going backwards, and this, and again, this is always a question I hate asking, but it's, it's a hype because it's a complete hypothetical. The players that we have say today, a Tom Brady and, and Tom, it might be unfair using a guy like Tom Brady or maybe a Brett Favre. Brett Favre, it might be a good example, but it's say if you put him in the in the setting in the sixties, do you think he would have been just? A, do you think he would have been successful? I think when you look at some of the great players, you yeah, know, you would mention Tom Brady, Brett Favre. Um, you take any of the the great players today, I think they'd still have the leadership. I mean, they wouldn't have had the workout regimens and the diet and stuff like that like they do right. today, but none of the other guys had it back then either. Right. I think, you know, when you're looking at, let's just say the quarterback position, you're looking at somebody who's a leader, somebody who's able to truly take the team, put them on their backs and carry them down into the end zone. And greatness is greatness, regardless of the era that they're in. So I would say you could definitely take the best players today, put them back in the older days, and they'd be able to survive. Um, if they still did some of the same stuff they did now, like, you know, take for, take for example, you've got 300-pound linemen. They would struggle as 300-pound linemen playing 60 minutes a game. They're not mm -hmm. able to just go in there and play a few downs and then take a break for a while and then play a few more downs they do that nowadays because they can heighten how well they're able to perform because they, they have that peak. They can keep right. hitting that peak because they can take a little bit of a break and then come back, hit that peak again. So they're able to truly dominate at their positions nowadays. Yeah. Play 60 minutes. And are you going to be able to carry that weight around for 60 minutes playing every single play? Yeah. That I think is where, you would have some of the struggles and you need to adapt to the era that takes some weight off. You're still going to be pretty quick. So you're able to do things that other people may not be able to do, but you do have to adapt to the times. Yeah. And it hadn't even thought about that. You know, the concept of load management was completely unknown back in the sixties or even the seventies. Obviously you had your third down running backs like Jim kick who, who, who slipped in there. But yeah, nowadays, yeah, it just, and that's why, you know, I'm a big, I love playing simulation sports and football. Mm -hmm. And I always do like doing the what ifs, you know, mm -hmm. comparing, <clears throat> you know, taking the 68 Colts and putting up, say, the 72 Dolphins. But then if you try to compare a team like the 68 Colts to even the 85 Bears or even the, it, it kind of, it's, you can't really make comparisons because obviously the rules were different. Mm hmm nutrition conditioning i mean back in the 60s they smoked on the sidelines yeah i mean <laughs> you know here we are nowadays where he <clears throat> can't even smoke in a stadium mm -hmm. so trying to compare eras is you know obviously numbers and you know th things have progressed so much over the years not mm -hmm. only going from a 12 game schedule to now a 17 game schedule but all the other components like you just said um you know, including, you know, your nutrition, your workout techniques and all that. So, yeah, I mean, you think back in the 1940s, you were discouraged from working out. Nobody was doing weight training back in the 40s. Right. It was discouraged. So, you know, the people that are hitting the weights hard now to get in the best shape they can possibly be in, they would, they wouldn't fit in back then yeah. because that's just not how things were done. <clears throat> right. Yeah. And it goes back to what, you know, a lot of, you know, back then it was a part time, Playing football was a part time. It's kind of like, you know, so here in Japan, we have the X League. 
and I don't know how familiar you are with the X League and in terms of how it's, but it basically to me it's a throwback league because mm-hmm. most of these teams here they're manned by players that it's a semi-pro league for lack mm-hmm. of a better term. You got a few paid Americans on each team, but that said, um, and just to watch games here, especially when the season starts in like August and August in Japan is basically like in some parts, it's like Mississippi in May. It just, it's brutally hot, brutally humid. And you see how gassed these guys are and how they, you see a lot of guys cramping up on, <laughs> cramping up on the field. Mm-hmm. But so, yeah, when you were talking about, you know, the NFL of the forties and the fifties for much of the world, except say in Canada, um, yeah, that's that's what it football is like even now today for, you know, your 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 leagues in Japan and even your leagues in Europe. And I know the European league is going to be starting play here over the summer, but and I really haven't quite followed that as much as I probably should. I'll probably do more of that this year. But the one thing I've noticed, at least with pro pro foot pro football or semi pro football. In Japan, I don't know which I should call it pro or semi-pro, but it's right in between there. Um, yeah, there's very, I see a lot of similarities of this league here to the way the NFL pro football used to be back, say, in the 40s and the 50s. So for me, it's always enjoyable watching these games because these guys are just regular guys earning a living and practicing a couple times a week. Um, and that's the way it was back in the way back when, as I like to say. Yeah. And, you know, you look at before you had the substitution rules like you'd see nowadays in the two platoon system. Can you imagine Tom Brady playing defensive back on defense? I mean, that's exactly what happened. (laughs) Yeah. Quarterbacks are back there on defense. They're covering passes and then they got to turn around and they're throwing the passes. Yeah. I mean, Sammy Baugh is a classic example Mm -hmm. of that. I mean, there was a guy that could do it all. Yeah, and he's a punter I, too. Yeah. yeah, and I still think, and this is just it's off as a sidebar too. When it comes to historical figures in football, Sammy Baugh never gets his due. Mm-hmm. When we're talking some of the greatest football players, I mean, occasionally he'll enter the convert, but then he's out. Yeah. It's like Terry Bradshaw, still to me one of the greatest quarterbacks, had four mm-hmm. rings. But when we talk greatest football players, he's greatest quarterbacks. He's never in the conversation. Same with Roger Staubach. These mm-hmm. guys, the older guys, never get their due. And that's, to me, um, it's a shame because we grew up with these guys and we saw them play. Johnny Unitas, nobody talks about Johnny Unitas anymore. Now, mm-hmm. I am, I, I, I'm too young to remember jo- Johnny Unitas. There's just, it shows you the age gap I'm in. But I remember well Roger Staubach, um, mm-hmm. Bob Greasy, and I started following Bob Greasy really kind of towards the tail end of his career. In fact, all these guys, Roger Staubach and, and Terry Bradshaw. Um, and I know we talked about re- um, recency bias and everything and the, and the, the lack, you know, people forget history. Mm-hmm. But if you had to pick, if you had to pick a player from the past, say a quarterback, to get things done, and we're talking, say, before john elway who would you who would you if you needed to grab somebody right off the bench it's like win the game for me who would you pick Mm -hmm. auto graham okay and there's and and the thing about auto graham is there's such people forget how many championships he won he took his team to Mm -hmm. and you know and everything else he did i mean people don't know you know his coaching career his college playing career. Um, and he's also from Chicago too, which, which he played at Northwestern. So, which, yeah, yeah you know, uh, way back, doesn't hurt. way back. Huh? Doesn't hurt, right? <laughs> doesn't hurt, doesn't hurt. But yeah, he had a coaching career at the Coast Guard Academy and um, he's just one of those phenomenal figures out of history that, you know, and that's why like, you know, with the Football Learning Academy and with PFRA, it's a group, you know, we, we don't forget those guys. So, yeah. And, you know, you take a look at Otto Graham too. I mean, I'm a big Otto Graham guy, as you know. So, yeah. Um, you look at seven championships, 10 straight championship games that he played in. It took Tom Brady twice as long to win as many championships. 
took him what 20 years to get yeah. ring number seven and then yeah people like to discount the all-america football conference and i never buy into that i've watched as much all-america football conference game film as exists out there so i've truly studied it and i've interviewed a lot of players that played in both leagues every single one of them that played in both leagues said that the All-America Football Conference was just as strong, if not stronger, than the NFL. The only negative that one player had said was that the worst teams in the All-America Football Conference were worse than the worst teams in the NFL. <laughs> but then he followed it up and saying, but the best teams in the All-America right. Football Conference were better than the best teams in the NFL. And the Browns proved that when they came in in 1950. They kicked the Eagles' butt twice that year. Yeah, the uh, time defending champion of the NFL. Yeah, that was it. Was it was the yeah? It truly was a Super Bowl because you truly had two champions meeting, and I, and that you know, and it's like, well, it was a quirk. As somebody says, oh, it was a quirk of scheduling. No, it wasn't because Burt Bell was making the schedule. He knew what he was doing. He specifically <laughs> did it on purpose to send a message that they were going to start the season Browns against Eagles so that the Eagles would humiliate the Browns and then they could uh, justify all the trash talk that they were doing throughout the late 40s of how yeah. the NFL was better than the All-America Football Conference. Then Cleveland came in and showed them up twice that year. So <laughs> pretty much says everything you need to know. <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, too, and then just a few, really, you think about it just in terms of years and everything, you know, less than – Almost oh, about 10 years later, you had the American Football League come in. Mm -hmm. And when talking, you know, now everybody is talking about spring football and all this and the NFL. And somebody made a compare. And this is on this is on Twitter. This is why I spend way too much time here. While everybody in America is asleep, I'm looking at Twitter because everybody I'm 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 I don't have a job yet. Um <laughs> And somebody mentioned about, you know, well, look at the American Football League. It was, well, I'm like, well, dial that back a bit. Okay, do you realize that the American, at that time, there were I, there were 12 NFL teams, if I've got my math correct, mm -hmm. when the AFL came in, um, America was much different. We, don't, I mean, people don't realize that how different america was in the 60s to now and we only had three television networks i lived in chicago so i like to say we had at least five because you had your independent channels mm -hmm. um but now we've entered an age now where where people are so even with the xfl um dwayne johnson put out hey the the all-time spring attendance record and i literally went joe zimba like he joe does every time the the packer graphic pops up it's like way no 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 and it just to me i get disheartened when people just kind of buy into it and don't do don't do the research and again maybe maybe i'm just the you know the old man yelling at the sky going hey you know but when it i don't know i think i think real football fans and i i say try to distinguish between real and just casual because i'm a casual fan right now of a lot of sports there's a lot of history in these sports i don't know but for you and I, I mean, we grew up with this game. So this game, so when somebody makes a statement, puts a statement out there that's completely wrong, yeah, we kind of take it personal because we grew up with this game. This game, in a way, keeps us young. I mean, we're, mm -hmm. you know, we're, we're both, we're both older. Mm -hmm. But, and can I know you got to be like me, when, when you watch a game, especially if you watch an old game, an old clip, I was watching, um super bowl 16 last week i was sitting down this is where the joy of discovery i'm reliving the joy of discovering professional football through the eyes of my brother-in-law okay mm -hmm. my brother's japanese doesn't speak a word of english i don't speak a word of japanese but he loves joe montana because he grew he grew up playing the um tecmo bowl and have mm -hmm. playing joe montana on tecmo <laughs> bowl and so I'm sitting there with him and we're watching YouTube. Our wives are doing something in, in the kitchen and, and, and they were, but him and I, I go, Hey, have you ever, um, 
do you know who Walter Payton is? No. And there was that moment. I'm like, oh my God, I, I'm living. And so I, I showed him clips of Walter Payton and his eyes got big. And I told him, I go, Walter Payton in Chicago was bigger than Michael Jordan. Hmm. And my wife's like, what? That's not, I go, no, it's true. Because when Walter died, you literally, and we, when Walter Payton died, there was just that Paul, everybody, it was like, everybody kind of stopped. Hmm. And, um, and so with football history, to me, as I'm watching him, I'm like, I'm, I'm like 12 again. It's like, this is cool. <laughs> I got somebody to, to share this stuff with. So do you still get that like high of childhood when you, when you sit down, open a history book, um, or even especially when you do an interview mm-hmm. with a player that you watched, that you watched growing up or, or watched as a young adult, um, do you still get that thrill? Absolutely. I mean, to be able to connect with some of these players when I'm doing the interviews, it was, you know, it's an incredible experience. And, you know, one person, Zeke O'Connor, one of the greatest human beings you'll ever know, he dedicated his life to to helping other people after he was done professional football. But, you know, he was a CFL guy too, won a great cup, yeah. mm-hmm. coached up there. But um, I got to sit down on a couch with him and watch game film of a game that he played in. 1948 and to sit there and have him say this is what we were thinking at this time this is what i was seeing when i was running my routes this is what was what was going on you can't beat an experience like that right and so you know to be able to do something like that to be able to talk to these players to be able to get inside the huddle with these players to find out you know, what was the team thinking at the time? What were mm-hmm. they, what were they seeing? What were they trying to do? I love it. And I just can't get enough of it. And now you add in the fact when I'm interviewing them, I'm talking about what they've done after football. Right. Um, you really make that personal connection with them. And so that's why it's so important to me to be able to try to help them in any way that I can. Um, because, you know, it just means so much to me, yeah. the connection that I've had with them. Yeah. And if you could, before we, we wrap, we wrap here, um, let everybody know how to find the football learning Academy and, um, how to sign up and, you know, um, or to find you also too on social media. Yeah. So the football learning Academy is at www.football dash learning dash academy.com. Uh, there, there's an all courses button. Just find the course that you're interested in or multiple courses that you're interested in. You sign up, you become a student, enroll in the class, and you're off and running. Um, classes are always available for you. Uh, it remembers where you left off. So if you don't have time to watch the entire class, you can pick up where you left off. You always have access to it. You can watch it as many times as you want. So there's plenty of uh, plenty of different types of topics like we talked about earlier that you can sign up for, and we're always trying to put out more content. As far as social media, I'm on Twitter at footballlearn1, uh, also on Instagram, on Facebook, on LinkedIn. So um, pretty much the, most of the uh, social media channels out there we're on. So find no us TikTok, anywhere. Huh? And, what's that? No TikTok. Huh? Uh, no TikTok. <laughs> sorry i could help it no worries yeah yeah we're not doing tiktok <laughs> yeah and uh, I, it, you know when it comes to your course offerings there's one course in particular i want to plug because um you know everybody's talking spring football and now we've got the usfl the the starting up because people forget people don't re- remember there was a a United States Football League <clears throat> back in the 40s. And you have a course on that, which is just, it's amazing. And that's, uh, again, goes to what we said. Everybody forgets, say hey, this is coming out, the second version of it. No, it's not. It's the third version. So football history. And I always, every now and then you'll you'll see me post something. I know you've, you've seen it where I always say, hey, football history matters. 
And uh, mm-hmm. it, it's very true. So with that, I'll give you the final word here before we wrap up um, with, with courses. Um, among the people, um, the interviews you have in the Football Learning Academy, um, for those listening, what are some of the, uh, the, the ones you would highlight on the FLA if, um, if you were to put out a flyer or something? Hey, we've been reviewed. You know, come listen to this guy. Mm-hmm. I would say um, Amy Trask, first female CEO in NFL history. Yeah. Uh, that was definitely a fun interview. Shannon Easton, who was the first female on-field official in NFL history. Sarah Thomas gets all the attention and all the publicity, but Sarah was second. Shannon was first. Um, so we have a pretty uh, pretty good interview with her on there. Um, I've got some of the archival interviews. Don Shula's on there. Um, soon I'll be releasing one on Gino Marchetti. Um, we've got plenty of others. Mercury Morris is there. Um, oh, Mercury Morris is always always an interesting listen. <laughs> yes, he is. Marlon Briscoe, we had him as part of our uh, first black quarterbacks class. Uh, so there's lots of fun stuff, lots of different topics. Um, but yeah, there's a separate section just for the interviews that we have. Um, and, you know, the Ben Troop one, too. There's two of them out there. He is, he is an amazing person, and it was a lot of fun uh, with those interviews. So definitely check those out as well. All right. Well, thank you very much uh, for sitting down with me and you and I'll talk a little bit after I press the stop button here, but with everybody else who's listening. um, Hey, thank you very much. Thank you very much for listening. Hopefully Scott will be back off assignment next time you hear from us. And uh, you know, hopefully uh, his, uh, his UAB basketball team uh, wins a championship tonight. So him and I were, he gives me, he gave, you know, and, and Kenny gave my regards to just to let, he just wanted me to let you know that, hey, you know, he, he wishes he could have been here, but you know, he's like, I appreciate no, I got, it. I got to be at a hoops game. I got no man. I understand. <laughs> I understand. No problem. Um, no worries. But, thank yeah. you. But for everybody else who's listening, uh, everybody who's listening, thank you very much for tuning in, and you will be hearing from Scott and I very very soon. Bye bye.
Hey there, sports history fan. This is Arnie Chapman, a.k.a. the Football History Dude. And I hope that you enjoyed this recent episode presented by the Sports History Network and were able to learn some good old-fashioned sports history knowledge nuggets. I started the Sports History Network back in 2020 with the mission to help podcasters find a community of like-minded sports history nerds as well as helping aspiring podcasters to start their own shows. We have a little bit over 30 shows on the network right now covering all sorts of sports history, but as far as I'm concerned, we're just at the toothpick in the ocean moment, you know that. Can't even figure it out because there's so much more coming. We wanted to create the ultimate headquarters for sports yesteryear, starting with Podcast Network and our website, but we're going to continue to move into other mediums as well. And here's the cool part, because we want you to be part of our team. So if you're interested in starting your own podcast, or maybe being a guest on one of our shows, Or who knows, maybe even writing an article for us over on the website. Seriously, all you gotta do is reach out to us on the contact page over at sportshistorynetwork.com. You can be as technologically savvy as a Neanderthal tapping on a stone trying to figure out this whole hieroglyphics thing back in the day. Again, it doesn't matter, because even if you don't understand the whole podcast space, we have a production team that can pretty much help you out with doing everything. All you gotta do, head over to sportshistorynetwork.com, head to the contact page, Fill it out. That message goes right to me, and I'll reach out to you as soon as I can. But for now, dude, I'm through if you're through.